Tinktera's mission is to help fintechs come to market with partnerships with banks. So the way you should think about it is every day, new ideas and new communities are forming around financial services. And what we see is things like um, folks who are wanting to create a bank for people that like pets, someone who likes to create a neobank for people that are in the medical industry, maybe doctors or nurses or whatever. And each of these um, fintech companies ultimately needs a bank to go to market because in the US you have to have a banking license in order to be uh, able to move money and to store balances for consumers. And so the challenge is if you're a fintech, most of them are getting started who have relatively limited resources and yet have to go and create a bunch of relationships with a whole bunch of tech, tech companies like someone for you know your customer KYC, someone for managing the ledger, keeping track of the transactions that posted to the account, someone to print debit cards and so on. And what we do for fintechs is we build all of the APIs they need to launch a neobank. So we help them deal with all of that complexity of business relationships. We deal with all of that in one go and we, we've made it a simple one-stop one shop connection to us. And then we deal with all the partnering that's needed. The second part of the problem for the FinTech is they need a bank. And the reality is right now in, in the US, there are way more FinTechs getting funded than there are banks available to launch them. Because most community banks that do FinTech banking can maybe do one a month or one every quarter new FinTechs. And there's way more FinTechs getting funded every week than there are slots of launch. So what we're doing on the second side of, on the other side of the marketplace is encouraging and working with new community banks to join the FinTech marketplace. So think of it like um, you're a community bank in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and you want to create a new line of business, which is called working with FinTechs. How do they do that? What resources they need? Most of that's opaque and unknown to them. We give them a playbook that says, okay, here's how you talk to your regulators. Here's how you think about billing and accounting and reconciliation. Here's the oversight you need to place on the fintech to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. And together it's a matchmaking experience. So think of it a little bit like, I don't know, Tinder for banking. So fintech comes along and says, completes their profile and says, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing remittances to Africa and I wanna create a deposit account for my customers in the US. And we then surface that anonymously to the banks and say, okay, we've got this FinTech. They just raised 20 million from Sequoia. They're really well funded, but they're doing remittances. And many of the banks will say, actually, I don't like remittances. It's too scary for me. So I opt out. And then we find two or three banks that say, yeah, actually we'll bank them. And we tell the, fint the banks, what price would you like to set for all the services? And then we go back to the FinTech and we say, we've got two or three bids for you. Which one do you want? One's a little bit more expensive, but can launch tomorrow. One's pretty cheap and they can launch in six months and one in the middle that's about medium pricing but they want a three-year contract and so it's the decision for the fintech is price time for launch and duration of relationship are the three drivers that really matter so that's in a nutshell two-sided marketplace fintechs on one side needing bank partnerships banks coming into the marketplace becoming supply so demand is fintech supply is banks and then helping them price and meet in the middle and then once, once they agree on a relationship, we let them sign contracts between each other. And then we think Terra operate the whole platform for everybody. I got involved sort of in July, August timeframe as we were sort of considering starting things up and, and joining the team. Um, officially, I think I started in mid-September. Since then, uh, we did a very successful fundraise for our seed round and raised $12.4 million, which was really uh, awesome. Great partnership with Lightspeed as our lead investor. And then after that, uh, over the last, and we announced that, that December 8th. And since then we've been focused in on signing new banks and signing new fintechs to come onto the platform. Um, and what's been really interesting is we've not had any sales team. We've just, our first two salespeople started yesterday, which is like crazy, but inbound uh, interest from banks and inbound interest from fintechs has been really tremendous. And so now we're in the process of finalizing all the product builds and we should be super go to market ready in August or September timeframe. But between now and then we're working with various fintechs on using our APIs to get started, build their first stages of their applications. And uh, the, the trick now is sort of managing all the demand, growing out the operational teams to actually take these projects to market um, and sort of follow the natural crazy hockey stick of growth, which is really fun at the moment. Two or three folks that are 
uh, playing in the same game as us of offering a set of APIs to fintechs. Um, and those are UNIT, Treasury Prime, and to a certain extent, Synapse. Um, there's also a company called Bond, um, but they've been less prominent of late. In the marketplace in general, we see UNIT and Treasury Prime as the folks most commonly, a fintech will come to us and say, hey, I've been talking to these guys, do you have some feedback and, and so on. So those ones are pretty top of mind at the moment. Um, the market is really, really large. So at the moment, it's not a scarcity of customers. There's, there's more than enough deals for all of us to, to absorb. Over time, I suspect a couple of us will end up taking a more lion's share of the marketplace. And I think what's gonna drive that is gonna be a combination of, do you have really good pricing to the FinTechs? And do you have good opportunities and launch opportunities? So can you get customers to market quickly uh, in a safe and compliant manner? And the, the difference in many ways between us and most everyone else in the game is we're not actually pricing the service, the banks are. So if you're doing a deal with somebody else, basically the FinTech comes along and they get a price sheet and that's the price. And maybe you get some volume discounts, but that's it. In our model, we'll actually give you three different prices based on the different banks desire to win the deal. Some banks will say, I really, really need deposits because I'm doing a burgeoning lending business. So I'll give a lot of interchange to the fintech. Another bank might say, you're a really risky fintech and you're doing crypto. So I'm going to be quite expensive, but I'll bank you and realize not every fintech will be able to be banked. And our job is to both su supply the fintechs with the best price, but also to look at giving them different opportunities. So for example, there are very few banks that will do business with cannabis fintechs. But there are plenty of cannabis fintechs that are trying to solve last mile of how do you give money to the person delivering your cannabis. And, um, and there's various regulations, it's complicated. And so finding the right bank partner for those use cases is difficult. And what, what's interesting about the model as it expands over time is because we will give fintechs to different banks across the ecosystem, we'll, we'll not have the risk of any one particular bank um, saying, I don't want to do this anymore or getting some sort of overcommitment and being told they have to slow down because we'll have multiple opportunities. So how did someone win in the market? Right now it's pretty wide open. It's more about uh, showing that you can create value and creating products that are sensible and useful to the fintechs and really focusing on what they need. So for example, um, most fintechs are going to get to a point of wanting to offer a subscription service. And the subscription service might be you know, 10 bucks a month for child cards for your debit card, or it might be you want a, a premium platinum card, uh, we'll charge you 9.99. If you're a FinTech today, you have to go build that, some sort of charging system, some sort of scheduler and so on. We're building that into our platform because we know all the FinTechs need it and it's one less thing for them to build. And that's our continuous focus. What are the FinTech building across the board? How can we build those capabilities for them? and be less focused on what's banking as a service and more focused on what does a FinTech need to be successful? And by FinTech, I mean near bank, remittance company, that sort of thing. So our customers are the banks and, and we think of them both as customers and distribution partners. And the way you should think about it is we build or source technology for financial services and then we resell it via the banks. So imagine something like a ledger. We built a ledger the normal price a FinTech would be prepared to pay is somewhere between 50 cents and a dollar per user per month for the ledger. We actually give the ledger at cost zero because it, it's Google Cloud, it's cheap, it's nothing to the banks. And we tell the banks price the service between 75 cents and a dollar per user per month to the FinTechs. And we rev share the revenue 50-50 with them. So if they charge a dollar, we get 50 cents, they get 50 cents. Similarly, if the, the bank is offering their debit card license, the revenue model for debit cards or for interchange rev share is something along the lines of FinTech keeps 80 to 90% of the revenue earned on the debit card swipe and the bank keeps 10 to 20%. We, Sinterra, take half of whatever the bank keeps. So if the bank can win a deal at 80, 20, so think 100 bips to the FinTech, 40 bips to the bank, we would keep 20 bips. And for our 20 bips, we operate the whole platform for the bank. We do the reconciliation, we run the card processing and so forth. So our model is very, very aligned to the bank's success, which is they set a price, we give them the services at wholesale and the delta between wholesale and retail pricing, we split with them 50-50, adjusted net revenue, basically. 
So the core of the platform is the ledger that we've built, which is um, the way to keep track of all the transaction activity across all of the fintechs. And we use it to both flag transactions that seem dodgy from a fraud perspective, but also to recognize, you know, what's your balance, what's transacting and so forth. And our ledger has two modes of operation. One is passive, where we just ingest all of the transaction activity from a fintech and the fintech does its own thing. Um, and think of that like a fintech's already built an app, they're running on a bank, the bank needs better tools to monitor and manage the fintech, we provide that service. So we're not invasive into the fintech's app, they don't even have to call our APIs, we just take all the data from Galileo or Marketo or Finzact or whatever, ingest it, track all the ACH activity, and then we know what's happening in their ecosystem. So that's one mode. And then there's primary ledger where we are the source of truth for the transactions. And in that mode, all the API calls come to us. We might send a message to the fintech, hey, this transaction's occurred. Do you want to approve it or deny it? If they don't answer in a certain time frame, we'll either approve it or deny it based on our fraud understanding and so on. So at the core of all financial services is, is a ledger of some kind. In the old days, when I built a core banking system, we just called it the deposit core system, the core banking system. Um, these days you'll hear about us a ledger at Uber. We had one, uh, we called it the Gulfstream and it was a two-sided ledger to keep track of riders on one side and drivers on the other and making sure that whatever the rider paid, we portioned correctly to the drivers as we paid them out. So ledger is the core of everything that we do. And then layered in on top of that, uh, are diff different services that will be progressively built on ML for fraud detection and other things like that important thing that's different about or what's unique about the US is the there's a law that says if you're a bank worth more than with 10 billion or more in assets you can no longer charge full interchange so it's called the Durban amendment and so community banks have this unique thing which is they can charge 130 to 140 bits of interchange for a debit card swipe whereas if you're Bank of America or Chase you cannot do that and so even if you're a big retail bank, you're not gonna be attractive to a FinTech to use their platform because you won't have the revenue to share with the FinTech. And so you could synthesize it and you could just say, I'll pay it as though it was interchange, but they, they, the, the business model won't work. So this is uh, relatively uniquely a, a domain for the FinTechs to be powered by community banks. And there have been some community banks that have built quite large franchises, the biggest of which is Bancorp but there's another one called NetSpend and there's another one called MetaBank and Green Dot as well, who have built lots of fintechs and have built out a business of reselling their license to others. But uh, they all have to stay below the $10 billion cap or else they're not attractive anymore. 